go ahead and get started. So everybody, thanks for joining the meeting. And um, I think we got a lot of stuff here. I see I've got a lot of updates from various leads. I know some people were able to join the meeting time live. Um, other people left some updates. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get into it. But um, let's see, just to dive in here. Uh, you know, going back to our objectives, uh, continue to be really proud of the community that we're building here. Um, continue to see new people join. Uh, we will talk a bit. Hopefully, I think we lost Sandy, but I'm pretty sure she'll be back. Um, Sandy and John have been off working with a lot of standards groups. I think some of the other folks on here may have been on some of those calls as well. So we'll get an update, but um, working really hard to get these built into more standards, um, engaging with government, commercial entities, um, just getting a really good reception to the work out there as a, as a foundational work. And I think what people have come to really respect as the first well-organized piece of research in this area that is still very unknown. So um, great job there. One of the things that I will be doing uh, over the next couple of weeks is working with some people to update the roadmaps. Um, I think what we know is we got out the 1.1 release during the month of October. Um, really good uh, reception for that. I uh, have some updates from ads. I don't know whether he's going to be able to join live or not, but um, you know what I have seen, uh, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago that got published this week um, with a lot of really good information on 1.1. Uh, the localization releases, I think we've had some fits and starts there. So we're going to get those ready to go soon. I think a lot of work has gone into that. Um, and um, but we'll need to sort of figure out what the schedule is on that. And then um, I think towards the end of the meeting, I want to talk about 2.0. Um, I think we have an update from Emmanuel and team on the data gathering, but I want to talk about the project kickoff for it. So we'll go ahead and go through the reports from the various leads, and we'll just go in the order that people put in the slides and uh, get updates from everybody on what's going on. There's a lot. So we'll just go ahead and go through uh, ads' update here, but uh, I continue to see ads out there along with a few others really jumping on the issues getting filed in the GitHub. Um, you know, good suggestions ranging from relatively minor things to, you know, sort of major suggestions on approach going forward. So those are great. And we get those all actively tracked in the GitHub questions about translations there. And I think that is one of the things that we need to work out. Um, I don't know if we have Talesh on today either. I think he might've left us an update though. By the way, the 1.1 uh, diagram, uh, that's been one of the sort of, I think best received parts of the 1.1 release, sort of very new part. People have commented very specifically on uh, appreciating the ability to kind of understand where in a typical architecture those things sit. And um, maybe for those of us who are involved the whole time, we kind of developed an intuitive understanding of that. But for somebody coming to this new, um, maybe even somebody who has not developed an LLM application before, kind of seeing that architecture, seeing the vulnerabilities in context, um, seeing a lot of really good feedback about that. So that's great. All right, style. I think we have Jason yet today, but um, I think one of the things that he's homing in on is some of the things about language. There's been a lot of topic um, or a lot of discussion on that topic on the GitHub or sorry, on the Slack site, which is great. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just open this up for a minute. Um, I am curious for anybody on the call, if people have thoughts about sort of terminology around security versus safety, I think safety's become uh, a really hot topic out there. Um, you know, just read the news, right? You know, Europe's having summits on it, uh, US presidents issuing orders on it. Um, definitely related to security. And I think our work has a lot of overlap with it, but thoughts on sort of maybe more fully capturing the safety aspect in what we're doing going forward. Anybody got comments? 
Yeah, well, well my, my point is easy. I was a big fan of uh, considering the effects of the generative AI on the, on the real world. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so the thing is, I, I do consider that we should uh, take safety into account. I, I wouldn't ever confuse the two terms because I, I heard sometimes that it happens, but outside, outside always, of course. And, uh, and so I would make a clear statement that we are considering the aspects of, you know, the digital world coming out in the, in the real world and in, in a form, in form of safety. And since the generative AI is becoming more and more multimodal and, and starting to command objects, I, I would say, or at least to give suggestions how now to use uh, objects uh, in an industrial environment, this would could become, you know, the AI providing suggestion on how to use equipment. Now, it, when we get to that, we will need safety to already be in place. So I think that these two converging worlds uh, should be should be considered moving forward. Um, Sandy, did you want to chime in? Yeah, we definitely need a definition, but it's one of the things that I work through, um, you know, as I've tried to wrap my head around this, which is, is the difference between the OWASP top 10 LLM working group versus the AI privacy and security working group. And so when I try to, um, you know, figure out the problem that I was trying to solve for, the reason I joined and I was excited to be part of this project was I knew that, that, um, Team, cybersecurity team specifically, you know, I'm always looking at it from my point of, from that threat, um, you know, what's going on with that, that they were trying to d- defend against prompt injection, indirect prompt injection, you know, things that were going to th- um, cause harm to the environment while well, as the business was requesting to, to go fast and put all of this stuff in. So that would really be my question to you, Steve, and to Rob, which is how do we help our users so they know what what information that they find within the OWASP large language model, which is just really just a, a one piece of a very big and difficult conversation around AI privacy and security. That's a great point. Uh, Prasad, you got your hand up? Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, folks, uh, this is my first meeting and I'm excited to be part of it. And I echo what Ravijio and uh, Sandy were saying, like, but the type of content and the uh, uh, and the expertise that is needed for this is much broader. And I would try to see like we can make it re- related, but like have it something fairly scoped and focused on that, and see how we can uh, separate uh, I, how we can contrast between these two things, and also somehow put some relations but be self-contained and so on. That way people are not confused uh, by this big bucket of items and so on. Cool. All right, I'm just seeing if we got any other hands raised. All right, good to get those comments and good to get them on the recording as we dive into this. Um, I think as we do get to the 2.0 kickoff, those are some of the the big debate items that we'll have around um, scope and, just one comment. One of the things that I'm planning to do for the 2.0 kickoff is take our group charter and basically put it up for comment again. Um, I think uh, for those of you who were in the group from really early, that was one of the first things that we did in the first two, three weeks was develop that charter. And um, the groups changed a lot. The landscapes changed a lot. Um, but the idea that we put that up, we had pretty broad involvement commenting on it uh, early on. A lot of people did, and I think it it served us well for the first phase, but I think updating that um, and getting a lot of commentary on it would be one way to inform what we want to do as a group. And to Sandy's point, how do we scope what our group's trying to do versus what are we, um, you know, depending on other groups to do and referencing off to them, or what do we want to take the lead on? Let's see. I see that ads popped on. So, uh, Ads, welcome to the meeting. You want to get, hit your updates? Thank you, brother. Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Um, and sorry my slides are terribly formatted and just ugly. Um, 
But I guess maybe this is a bit more between the the core team. So I just wanted to give an update on a few things that I was thinking about, um, and also things just kind of like in in the work in progress. Uh, so myself and Bob are actually meeting tomorrow, um, and we're actually looking on way. Well, we're kind of brainstorming on ways to enhance, uh, which will be a work like continued working effort, ways of enhancing the diagram, and to incorporate different elements um, that typically go go into an LM application and then risky uh, mapping those to additional uh, risks and CWEs. Um, I raised an actual like main issue, uh, which I think is probably the best way for people if any kind of request or anything like that to maybe just put it in that issue rather than create multiple different issues, uh, just a way for us to kind of easily triage the work. Um, so I know John also requested RAG, which is something I thought about as well. So uh, that's awesome. So any ideas or anything like that, then please feel free uh, or anything you're unclear about or unsure about, then uh, throw it in there. Um, the other thing I think we need to, because there's a lot of tasks uh, or GitHub issues, sorry, that were raised prior to V1.1 or during 1.1, we do have like a task between the core team to go through the existing um, issues that are open. So I might actually tag with the V2 label I created because they were like talking about like changing some of the top 10, which is out of scope for V1.1. Um, and then we need, I, I guess we need a bit more of a, like a rigorous um, gatekeeping method um, to, to be, to be honest, um, which is more of like, I guess something between us. Working with trans, uh, working with Talesh on translations, who I think might have spoken already, has spoken. Uh, sorry, might have spoken or is going to. Uh, so I need to work out with him how we're going to embed those in the site. But in terms of like the actual site, it took me a while because I'm not a web dev. But everything should be updated now. Any problems, please reach out. Or anything that anyone wants, including, then just hit me up. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much me. Yeah, ads. Thanks for diving in there Thank and uh, tackling the the website thing. Um, and uh, you know, I think on the last call we mentioned um, Jason for diving in and, and rescuing the PDF, and um, ads for going in and figuring out how to make the the website work. That's great. Um, one of the things we should do, ads, is um, maybe put up a call on the main list for a couple other web developers who we can share. You know share that knowledge out with and um uh let's figure out like where we store the keys to that in some place that uh we don't wind up with a, a single point of failure on that again yeah for sure no, uh, i saw it out like the single point of failure issue so they should be good if anyone's like a web dev on this call right now and um, is fancying some you know on the side project work as a gig or whatever then yeah please reach out to me i'm the guy with the avatar in the top right you'll see on slack but i will put out and like a shout out as well so thanks Steve. all right awesome all right moving past style newsletter uh will hey everyone hey steve uh i'm gonna take over screen sharing so i can uh go through this uh as i need to so just give me one second cool and you all can see my screen now right the slide yeah, deck very fancy okay. artwork by the way <laughs> thank thank you uh Did dolly you three diffusion? yeah yes, dolly dope. three chat gpt uh i asked it for like 10 different uh artistic versions and so this i thought this one was the coolest so uh yeah uh That's so anyways dope, I love it <laughs> thank you uh so uh we've had three different editions of the newsletter uh so far uh, with the October one, uh, nine or 10 days ago. Uh, and our current, uh, number of subscribers is up, uh, towards 320 Now we're getting about three to five people on average, uh, per day. I get a, a email every day telling me the amount of new, uh, subscribers. So that's awesome. Whoops. And, uh, the main way that we're having people subscribe, uh, you'll see up at the top, it says website direct. So that means they're just coming directly to LLM top 10.beehive.com. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the other ways that they're uh, finding the uh, website to subscribe is via LinkedIn. So like the website or the Android app, uh, they're coming in through our, our GitHub. Uh, that, that fifth one that says LLM top one website, 
just cutting off the uh, full mm-hmm. URL, but basically those people are coming in through the uh, LLM top 10 website um, and one from Slack and one from Twitter. So you can see most of the traffic or, or most of the people coming to subscribe are either coming directly or from LinkedIn. Um, the So uh, alongside the metrics around subscribers, uh, Beehive also gives me metrics around what are people clicking within the newsletter. So here's the top 10 uh, items that were clicked uh, uh, in the recent newsletter, the October one. Uh, the top item was the that vulnerable list of LLM apps that uh, ads have put together. Next up was the 1.1 PDF uh, hosted on the OWASP website. Uh, third was the 1.1 diagram on our uh, LLM top 10 website. The fourth was Google's uh, bug bounty article for Gen AI features. And the fifth was just the website in general. So you can kind of see what people are interested in learning more. Uh, and then my request. So uh, please keep sharing the newsletters and the subscribe page on LinkedIn. Seems like that's one of the best ways to get people to uh, follow us. Uh, one uh, thing that I've learned uh, is that it's great if you tag the people or tag people in these posts. So then it spreads out to their audiences as well. So I've started doing that whenever I share it on LinkedIn. I tag each of you that has content in the newsletter or even the um uh, third parties that I might link to their uh, YouTube videos or their additional content, I'm tagging them. And so then it gets out to their audience. And so it helps spread the message. Uh, please send me any feedback you have about the newsletter. Uh, I haven't got any uh, negative feedback, which is great, but I, you know, I'd love either way uh, learning more about what you think about it. And also please send me any content that you have that you think should be featured. Uh, right now, the way that I'm doing it is uh, I'm going through recordings whenever we have them. I'm going through the slide decks. Uh, I'm going through Slack to see the different conversations. And then just my own uh, research, you know, throughout the month, finding stuff that I think would be interesting to our audience. So um, if you have content you'd like to see uh, in the newsletter, please let me know and, and we'll figure out where it best fits. And I think that's it for my slide. Any got anybody got comments for Will? Uh, I, I just wanted to say, yeah, it's dope. Love it, Will. Um, really cool. Um, I'd like to work with you, maybe um, getting some kind of official like call or submission or something like that for the vulnerable applications. Um, I admit I've been a bit lazy in actually doing it, but um, I see So I need a few people who can keep us all kind of uh, intact and kick me up the ass as well. So that'd be, that'd be good. Yeah, well, I'll just say it. This is um, this is amazing. You're doing a great job with this. Uh, thing I loved there was uh, you, just your graph of subscribers. Um, you never know when you do these things. You put it out, you get an initial little blip. Um, I just love seeing that consistent upward trend. Um, uh, I think that means you know you keep putting in the work on this, and the group keeps putting out good stuff, and we'll have a thousand subscribers before we know it, and then up and on from there. And you know the the only regret I have is that we didn't have this up and running for the you know the 1.0 release that got a lot of attention when we could have driven a lot more subscribers for that spike. But as we go forward, um, I think actually um, getting out Sandy's document uh, will be a pretty big event for us. And so let's make sure that we kind of get the links to the newsletter and things captured in the the PR that we put out around that. So great work on this. Keep it up. By the way, I think we need to have like a contest for best science fiction wasp. Surely we're doing a Christmas theme one. Surely we're doing a Christmas theme. Christmas theme. theme. All right. A little little Santa hat. Seasonal. Yeah, I like it. (laughs) <laughs> All right. Um, let's Maybe see. We Sorry, this... we... uh, hey, Steve, what about a contest um, for the next newsletter? Well, well we, we could drive. Um, it'll give us a reason to post it on LinkedIn and go out to our channels. We're having a contest and your image will be in the next newsletter or something. I I love that idea. If you want to go uh, figure, figure out some figure out a framework for that, post it in the Slack channel, and we'll all go share it out and promote it. I think that's a fabulous idea. I want to compete. <laughs> and I, I actually put that in the uh, October newsletter up at the top with like the the uh, which one, but I might not have highlighted it as much. I, I said, hey, send us your best like Halloween themed ones. But um, I think I need to work on like my placement for it because that was kind of my goal as well, just to see if I could get people to uh, be active and send us content. But uh, yeah. yeah, I'll, I'll try. I, I love it. I think we'll, we can be really explicit with that. Um, and uh, that would be super fun. Um, 
All right, let's see. I don't think Talesh is here, um, but I think, you know, sort of the summary on what I've seen from what he's been posting is, uh, you know, he picked up some of this in flight. There are teams that have been working on translations. There are ones that are done or nearly done. Um, I think one of the challenges is some of these teams started on 1.0 and we lost momentum on translations uh you know, sort of before we got to 1.1. Um, but uh, let's see. Ads, were you raising your hand? Yeah, sorry. How the hell do you put your hand up in Zoom? Um, <laughs> there, there's a button, uh, and, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's way too technical for me. Um, yeah, so actually, sorry, just to echo on top of that, we have a few. We're currently in the process of collating, but they are V1.0. But I think the main perspective that Taleshi is trying to get at the moment is how he how himself and the community best finds like versioning control those because at the moment like we deal with everything through github um is like using like a github directory in our repo like like sufficient for translations probably not google docs are like the best way of collaborating but are we going to deliver like a pdf version of it or is it just going to remain in google docs or um, any suggestions, welcome on that, because I know Celeste is kind of looking for feedback because obviously he kind of owns it, but it's not just him yeah. like riding them. Um, and I really appreciate that it's probably a lot more complex updating these for people than it is than those updating um, the the, the uh, uh, US English version, which... Uh, I mean, look, I'll, I'll make a couple suggestions and, and ads. I'm happy to take this off with you and Talash, but... You know, one thing is worrying too much about tracking versions with this stuff being orthogonal. When you when you're doing software development with this stuff, if if you haven't gotten this all completely dialed in and automated, um, and we're not going to get this dialed in and automated, not with the tooling that we're using, so we shouldn't we shouldn't worry about it. And I think, you know, to put a fine point on it, I would rather have one dado in Chinese out there than keep delaying it, trying to catch up with 1.1. And by the time we catch up with 1.1, somebody will have decided that we need to patch the thing again and we'll just be, you know, chasing oh, it. Yeah. Um, 100%. I mean, I, I we can, like, the only thing with, obviously, like, Google, for example, is ownership. But, like, because, um, again, we kind of come to a single point of failure because you can become, like, an editor. You can have multiple editors of a document, but you can't have, like, multiple owners. So... The ownership is always going to lie with someone, which is just kind of the problem. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like just a working version would be great. And then that just gets updated as and when, but ultimately there's yeah. some kind of controls in place that stop people just obviously changing it completely. Yeah. The other thing that uh, maybe um, you could work on with Talash and maybe Jason is um you know the having the the flagship that we put out with such a beautiful pdf in that template that mike created is amazing but um i'm i'm not sure that we have a mechanism to sort of like deal with localization and things in that figma thing or whether i mean i know that's a fancy tool but i don't know if we know how to use it that well i would be perfectly happy if somebody wanted to put together a clean simple google docs template for a translated one of these with you know uh a cover page with the graphic that we use for the cover page for the flagship one and you know determination on style in terms of you know this is the font that we're going to use for headlines and this is how we're going to do it and and then just tell teams just like guys put it in this template generate a pdf and we're going to publish it yeah, I think no, that's that's a that's a great idea. Um, yeah, m maybe we just deliver it that way, and then we, I can actually store it in the site as an artifact rather than just have like a hyperlink, which is going to probably easily get broken or something. So, yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's the thing. We can, you know, when when you get one that that we're going to publish, we generate the PDF. You can download the Google Docs thing as an ODT or something, and just like you said, put it as an artifact on the site. It's frozen. It's versioned. And but we can just keep people moving on the the live one. And in, in the event that we have a disaster where we lose one of the main ones, you just pull the last one out of version control and boot it back up, rehydrate it. That's 
Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Okay, cool. All right, data gathering. Do we have a manual on today? Don't think so. So um, uh, let's see, it looks like uh, Emmanuel has put up some stuff on the wiki. He's looking for comments and um, and working on mapping some of this stuff. Um, anybody who's on today working on this stuff, I know some of there's a number of people who've been working on sort of the MITRE relationships and things like that. Anybody want to comment on this? Yep. Um, it's uh, Emmanuel's doing great work. Um, the conversations that we're having with MITRE and NIST are a uh, you know, for being able to be kind of the hub of feeding information and um, helping everyone, uh, you know, be able to come up with a common vernacular, common method, um, it, they're going well. So Emmanuel has kind of been working on his stuff. I've been um, playing around with doing some stuff and we have a, a, a plan to have a meeting so we can kind of merge what we've both been working on. So I was able to go in and pull all of the 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 published CVEs for machine learning language models, um, which map back to the CWEs. I just haven't figured out a way to do it automatically. I can go in and click and build it. Um, and the outcome of that is being able to come up with a cheat sheet. So if people are finding CVEs that they have an easy, that was one of the initial issues that Bob had was he was like, I'm not sure what the best way is to actually assign a score to this. So um, working on coming up with a cheat sheet so people have a common way to do it. Um, and uh, then um, we've met with Iraq. We've met with uh, a number, Oswego, you remember they published theirs. Um, they reached out to me uh, and they want to set up a meeting and talk about it. So we're in a great position to kind of be the communication hub for the different people who are publishing and reporting on these vulnerabilities and, and doing the scoring. All right, uh, Sandy, I think this is back to you. Okay, so um, as you know, most people know, I've, I've been working, when I first joined, I was um, immediately trying to figure out like how do we take the OWASP um, top 10 and create it into a format. So, um, you know, organizations know what they need to be concerned about as they move forward at this rapid pace to um, get these different large language models in, in their system. Um, and, you know, because it's been moving fast and I've been learning as I go, I've went through, <laughs> like Steve said, I mean, like, you know, I created like a what was it, Steve, like 24 pages or something? Like I just kept adding and adding and I had the worst version of scope creep ever. Um, but through a number of different re reworkings of this, I've been able to get rid of stuff that I felt like, um, <clears throat> to Pratt's point, like where does that fit? Does that align with our charter? Is, that, is it helping people or just adding more complexity to it? So I can share the, the current version if you'd like, or, or just send it. Okay, I'll go ahead and share it. What I've tried to do is just really simplify everything. So I've added a lot of pictures, um, explained the relationships. Um, people move into the checklist very quickly. You know, this is the steps to develop a strategy. Um, this. This is our deployment strategy examples. And then here's the checklist. And with the checklist, I've also included um, the different resources from OWASP and from MITRE so that you're, you're merging. The, you're, instead of um, looking at large language model issues as isolated issues, some of them are unique, but you sh you can use a lot of the existing process and tools to be able to reduce, you know, to evaluate them and then also to reduce your risk. So I have uh, I have the different tools, you know, why I've recommended it, where you would use it. And I've done that for both um, OWASP and for the MITRE tools that are available. So the next step for me, um, I'm I'm not a uh, 
I don't have Will's publishing skills for making things look really awesome. Um, I have all of these images, or, or I think it was Mike Finch who was really the graphicer. There's a number of people on this call that are, you know, significantly more talented than I am at actually making um, published documents look great. So as far as, you know, what I would like to have in this version, um, it is complete. And my ask is, you know, for some other people that are part of the group to take a look at it, you know, be critical, um, tell me what you like, what you don't like, and then um, support on trying to get it into a form that it has the same aesthetics that we have with the other OWASP things. Let's see, I guess the, the question are in terms of how much more, how much review do you think you've had on it? How much more do you want before moving to, uh, you know, sort of one that you want to put out for sort of broad public comment? Um, so if you want to pop your slides up, um, I'm, I'm pushing for, to have it, you know, ask for a couple of volunteers to help with, you know, the, the sanity checks and the review. And I'd like to publish by uh, the 15th okay. to actually have it out. Yeah. Are you going to call that like version dot five or, or something dot, like that? Oh, or, or dot five is fine. Yeah, yeah, let's do dot five. And you'll see on my roadmap, that was really my strategy too, was have some of the team look at it, get it out, and then uh, really open it up for public comment, public feedback, and then um, have version 2.0 kind of aligned with, um, like I put a date, just a tentative date of February 1st for an update. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what we did with the original list is we put out an, I think we called it like 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and then 1.0. And it was a way to kind of broadcast, Hey, this is, this is early. This is near final. And then this is the 1.0. So um, I'll leave it up to you how you version it, but that seemed to work pretty well is just a way people kind of seem to intuitively understand what numbers like that meant. Um, uh, I will, uh, I will put something up on the list and see if we can recruit some people to help with some basic kind of graphic cleanup and layout on this that we can get done for the, the zero to five release. I think, um, uh, even though the original on the original, the 0 0.5 was, was pretty early. The fact that it came out with some level of, visual polish on it, got it a lot more attention and things. So let's figure out how we get some people. I think we do have some people in the group who can chip in. And so, um, so what, what isn't in it, you know, I took out all of the legal and the regulatory stuff again, you know, I, I just felt like, um, because that there's so much complexity to that and there, it, that does seem something that the AI privacy and security group is, um, has within their scope that it made sense to um, save all of that information and then contribute all of what I have as far as links and information to to that a the OWASP AI privacy and security. Um, and so for the checklist, I'm going to focus on security uh, vulnerabilities and mitigation. So version two, I'd like to map um, the mitigations to the TT to the tactics, techniques, and, and procedures that we merge with attack and with working with MITRE, um, and then produce the AI, AI vulnerability scoring uh, cheat sheet. So any comments or additional feedback? Anybody? All right, well, Cindy, I'm really excited about this. I think, um, I don't know. I don't know if people took a look at the link I posted for the article that uh, came out this week about 1.1, but uh, the reporter did ask me about what was coming next from the list. Uh, I mentioned this, so that's highlighted in the article as a as a coming resource. And I think, um, look, we know that we've we've gotten a lot of attention from kind of more upper management crowds just because we're the only thing out there. Um, and I, I think people at the CISO level were never an intended audience for that original top 10 doc. So I think this will, I think this will get a lot of attention and a lot of buzz. So looking forward to this. That was surely a yeah. pun. Sorry, Steve, the buzz thing. Yeah. Sorry? If I can comment. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just saying, surely that was a pun. The, the wasp. 
the buzz buzz you said it was a buzz <laughs> the buzz yeah. yeah that was a good one <laughs> i do like how mean. sandy's science fiction wasp is bejeweled though it's very fancy yeah so on my point of view, I just want to say that I see a lot of attention from the CISO community. Being part of a CISO community myself, I can tell you that, yes, there is interest and there is this point of view. And uh, I can also tell you that in the last few years, very, very few years, um, CISO are very much more attentive now to what is a TTP, what is the migratory attack, why it's there, because it's actually telling a story, you know, in terms of you know, knowing better the threats that we're facing every day. So it's no longer a technical aspect, it's something that is discussed and because it's it's there to explain to the business what is happening in reality. And so I do think that the public will grow in that sense. And uh, and I would just want to say that mapping to the MITRE and mapping and using TTPs will be useful because it adds also that visualization to it. All right, so Sandy, I think you had a couple other things you wanted to, to highlight and I think we got time. Yeah, as long as we're, so um, I threw these slides um, in. These are the slides that I presented when we talked to MITRE. And it, again, if you haven't, you probably have all grasped this. I, I really think about threats like, you know, privacy, safety, um, you know, those kind of things are absolutely important. But what keeps a CISO sleepless is the thing that causes a breach, something that happens at there's a huge surprise and ha has a huge impact to their organization. So um, talking, so, you know, when I use MITRE, you know, within an organization, I cross map it to all of the other, you know, the HIPAA to um, PCI, but I'm leading with the MITRE attack framework. Um, and the other point, again, that I'm probably, you know, beating this into the ground, which is, is merging. You know, you want to be able to blend the protections that you need for the large language models with your existing uh, process procedures and controls, how you're looking at threats and how you're mitigating them so that you're you're not isolating, you're not treating um, large language model vulnerabilities and threats any different than anything else. Um, the other opportunity that I see is with machine learning um model vendors, uh, they seem to be really one step forward from some of the existing legacy um, practices that we have. So they're already talking about SBOMs. They're already talking about um, building by with securely by design. So those are, it's an opportunity for us as uh, CISOs or security people to actually raise the water table across our organization because they want this stuff. We can actually say, okay, great. You know, now let's let's do this across all of our assets. Let's have S bombs. Let's you know build this into our entire system as opposed to treating large language models as unique and special. So, um, if you want to go to the next slide, and so what I presented to Christina is really my view on the crosswalk. So, if you look up on the left, attack and defend actually have different mitigations. Um, defend is MITRE's best practices on how to defend your organization. And attack actually has mitigations too. They're not the same, but you can crosswalk them. And my uh, comment to her was, I, I don't need it all to be in one table, but I do need to be able to crosswalk it. So you see the Atlas mitigations here. I'm saying to, to MITRE, just, just add this to the table. Show me how they all relate to each other. And again, the slide down at the bottom, you know, thinking forward to threats, I want to be able to 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 um, incorporate machine language vulnerabilities, chat GPT vulnerabilities into my existing oval sticks, you know, how we're sharing threat intelligence. Um, and then you see off to the right, this is a cross map of NIST 853 um, to the MITRE attack and then and here's another example of the CIS, again, cross-mapped. Um, and then the bottom image is attack flow. And so ideally, I'd like to say, how is, it, how is somebody using this to get into my environment? What are they doing? How can I walk through how they're using these different uh, 
techniques to to breach something, you know, do privilege ex- escalation, get rid of their logs, show me how these attacks are taking place so I can go back through my organization and make sure that I have that defense in depth view. Um, and again, you know, the point that I'm trying to make is the safety, you know, the things that are less um, harder to actually define and are, you know, very, you know, there's a lot of nuance to it. Things like, you know, again, privacy, fairness, those are all very important, but let me crosswalk. Like, let's keep that in a different bucket. And Christina's comment back to me was, uh, you know, that they had actually tried it and ran into the same things. Now, what's our role in this? Our role is, is we have three major, there's, I keep finding different ones, but there's different um, people that are leading with machine learning vulnerabilities. Hunter has their bug bounty. Um, there's Garak has their system that they're using. I have a couple other ones. Um, and they're trying to like score and blend all of this. And I, and I really see our role as helping them, you know, navigate this so that, you know, my deepest fear is that someone throws a wrench or tries to do something unique and different that breaks and it makes it complicated to use what we already have as a pretty good system that's working. So let's let's make sure that we augment it and move forward so that we're supporting the existing that's working really well. And then, but still um, being able to track and communicate about the machine learning, the large language uh, issues. So I'll pause there. Does it make sense? And any questions? Anybody? Well, Sandy, I think this is really exciting. And I think, um, you know, this is obviously the kind of thing where if we can figure out how to map this, map our stuff into these kind of frameworks that will get infinitely more leverage on the work. So this is exciting and, uh, you know, keep going, let, let the team know how they can help. Yeah. I also want to, I also want, sorry, please. You go ahead. No, my, my view is I want to as well compliment about the work because I am, I completely agree that I mean, cross working is very important in my, my work as a CISO, I was really working always with multi compliance frameworks. I never, I never had just one Excel or something separated from the rest. I collaborated directly with Splunk when we had the new regulations in Italy for, you know, critical infrastructure protection to actually map the mitre on the naming convention that they used to have it in Splunk. So you have me there. I, I totally agree that, you know, having a, a cross mapping with something that, you know, in the end is becoming a tool within the tools. So, I mean, the mitre attack is used inside the tool that we use to defend. So on the technical side and on the business side is visible and it's getting more visible. So to maintain the links, you know, it's, uh, it's very important. And, and I totally agree also on how much important it is to have oval in, in the back end. I always used it. And, uh, and it's like 10, 10 and more years. I'm, I'm basing most of my analysis on systems and events and threats on the oval, you know, uh, you know, taxonomies and everything. So I, I totally agree. So Steve, let, I can show you, um, I actually did, um, Fabio, you'll really like this, um, but please reach out to me um, in Slack and let's have it. It sounds like you and I um, have some of the same perspective. Um, so this is so with the Atlas work, you can actually create your own JSON and upload and overlay this. And I'm happy if everyone, if anyone wants me to set up a, a meeting off, you know, a separate meeting where I kind of walk through all of this. But this is um, what I did. And again, the colors don't mean anything, and it's just me trying to work through it. This is our OWASP large language model top ten map to the Atlas framework. And then what you can do with Atlas Navigator is you can add, you know, these different mod modules together. So ideally, what we'll be able to do is um, pull the Atlas Navigator into the MITRE attack. Again, creating that holistic view so that you actually provide people um, a way to uh, look at their entire environment and understand risk and impact. 
Well, it's also very fast to be adopted on on you know on the tools because the tools are also using the same the same methods within. Really cool. Okay. Awesome. All right, team. Well, I think we're just about at the top of the hour. So um, we got a few minutes left. Any other urgent business anybody wants to raise? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up there. But uh, great work this week, team. Um, it's uh, it's awesome to see the 1.1 version out there. But what's so exciting at this point is just to see all the activity kind of going on around the core list where we're focusing on getting it uh promoted out there in the industry, getting more people subscribed to the newsletters and the LinkedIn's, um, uh, working with these international standards bodies. Um, this is where it really gets exciting. And so it's, it's exciting to see that the community that we built is kind of fanning this out. So everybody great work on all of that. And, uh, uh, one comment, I will post it on the list, but our standard two-week interval would land us on uh, American Thanksgiving uh, two Thursdays from now. So I think I'm just going to scrub that meeting. I'll put out an announcement around that, and then uh, we'll get the full group together again in December. So talk to everybody soon. Bye. Bye.